series. And so this year, as you guys know, we have spent a few weeks discussing how God is going to have us focus on growing in Christ. And we talked about how we're going to grow in Christ. We've talked about being motivated about growing in Christ. And over the past few weeks, we've discussed some helpful expectations that we should have as we grow in Christ. And so I'd like to end this series by giving one more helpful expectation. And so this morning, we are going to talk about the fact that growing in Christ requires generosity. And so as God's people, we cannot grow without learning to be generous. And I'm going to break this down, generosity, into three parts. So if you are taking notes, you will notice that there's a section on your bulletin to fill in the blanks, and so you can follow along with that. But the first thing that we need to know about generosity is this. We need to be generous with our finances. Generous with our finances. And now maybe some of you guys are thinking, oh, I see what you're doing. I see you're going to talk about giving. And on the same day, you're going to talk about the budget. That's pretty sneaky. To that, I'm going to say, yes, financial generosity does help meet our budget. This church, although connected to the Send Network, is an autonomous church. That means that there is no mothership sending down funds to this little church. This church and its mission is completely supported by your generosity. And so your giving does impact our budget. But as I mentioned just a moment ago, that is not the reason we are talking about generosity because honestly, I am not worried about the budget. This is God's church. And in case you didn't know, God's not broke. Money is nothing to God. I have seen God supernaturally provide over and over and over again. And so I am not afraid when it comes to budget stuff. God's going to take care of us. The reason why we are talking about financial giving is because it is part of growing in Christ. Now, money is a funny thing. It has this strange ability to capture our hearts. You know, Jesus knew this. That's why he said in Matthew 6, he said, No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one or he will love the other, or he will be devoted to one and despise the other. And check this out. It says, you cannot serve God and money. And I think most of us understand what Jesus is getting at here, how it, it really is easy. It's, it's easy for money to replace God in our lives. And I think it's easy because, it, because when we're honest, when we're just real, money plays an important part in our lives. When we have it, we feel secure. When we have it, we feel like we can provide for our family. And if we can get enough of it, it's almost like we can control our own destiny. Therefore, it's easy to make money one of the most important, if not the most important thing in our lives. And the things that I just described as far as what money achieves, those things aren't bad. It's good to have stability. It's good to provide for your family. The problem is something deeper than money itself. So look at this verse. I know, I know you guys have heard this quoted before, even in, not in church. It says, 1 Timothy, for the love of money is a, is a root of all kinds of evil. Now, does the Bible say that money is evil? No, it says the love of money is evil. And that is, I think, where the deeper problem lies. Because again, if we bring back Matthew 6, 24, Jesus knew how easily money replaces God in our lives. And how often we love money with the love that's reserved for God. Again, it seems like money gives us security, that it gives us provision, that it gives us control. But money doesn't do that. That's God's job. God is our security. God is our provider. God is in control. And so for the Christian, for us, we have to choose. Who is our master? Is it God? Or is it money? And if we are going to grow in Christ, we must learn to choose God. And you know what? The best way to learn this lesson is to be generous with our finances, to begin to give away that money by faith and obedience. And so let me just throw this out here before I say anything else about giving. The solution to our problem and what we're going to talk about today will not be found by me convincing you to put a few more extra dollars in that white box. It won't be found by convincing you that you should give a certain percentage of your income. It won't even be found by maybe if I was to start shaming some spending habits. 
Why? Because, again, money isn't the issue. Say this with me. God don't need my money. Let, let's say that with passion because it's true, and I think we like saying that. God don't need my money. God does not need your money. God doesn't need your money. God doesn't need anything from us. Paul told the Athenians this, Acts 17. The God who made the world and everything in it, being Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in temples made by man, nor is he served by human hands, as though he needed anything. God doesn't need anything. Since he himself gives to all mankind life and breath and everything. God doesn't need your money. The only reason you have money is because God gave you money. God doesn't need anything to us from us, especially money. But he does use our money to help us learn to love him. And that's what this is really about, this first point. It's about love. And the best person to teach us this lesson about love and generosity is Jesus. Look what Paul says in 2 Corinthians. Paul is writing to the Corinthians, and he's asking them to have ready this financial gift that they had promised to give the church in Jerusalem because they had heard that the church in Jerusalem was struggling and having a hard time, and they needed help. And Corinth said, we will help you, and that's awesome. But then some time passed, and they never followed through. And so Paul tells them in 2 Corinthians, he said, I'm coming to see you, and by the time I get to you, I want to make sure that you have that love offering, that financial gift ready. Now, he's saying that not because he's going to come in like the IRS, but because he wants, to, he wants them to prove their love by their generosity. And to help them understand how generosity proves love, he says this. He says, look to Jesus. Look at 2 Corinthians 8. It says, for you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that by his poverty you might become rich. Since the beginning of time, God has been telling mankind, God has been telling us, I love you, and I'm going to do something to save you. I'm going to save you from your sins. But guess what? He wasn't just on the throne from heaven just saying it. Just like, I love you, I love you, I love you, I love you. No, he didn't just say it. He proved it by generously giving. Earlier we sang in that song, King of Kings, there's a verse in there that says, from a throne of endless glory to a cradle in the dirt. 2,000 years ago, God gave an unbelievable gift of love. And it proved his love. Jesus, who sat on an endless throne of glory, was unimaginably rich. But because of his love for us, he generously gave himself. By coming to earth as a baby, born in a manger, and became, if you will, poor. And eventually even died for us. He gave us everything. And do you see why Paul is using this as an example, as Jesus as an example about how to prove love through generosity. This was Corinth's example, and it's still our example in the church. If we want to grow, we need to choose to love God over money, and one of the best ways we can do that is to be generous with our finances because it proves our love. It proves that we're growing in our faith and trusting God over our life. And let me read something else that happens, something else that grows when we are financially generous. Look at 2 Corinthians. It says, starting in verse 6 and chapter 9, it says, this is the point. Whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. And whoever sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Each one must give as he has decided in his heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace abound to you so that having all sufficiency in all things at all times you may abound in every good work. As it is written, he has distributed freely. He has given to the poor. His righteousness endures forever. 
Now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will supply and multiply your seed for sowing and increase the harvest of righteousness. You will be enriched in every way to be generous in every way, which through us will produce thanksgiving to God. For the ministry of this service is not only supplying the needs of the saints, but is also overflowing in many thanksgiving to God. By their approval of this service, they, the ones who receive the gift, they will glorify God because of your submission that comes from your confession of the gospel of Christ and the generosity of your contribution for them and for all others while they long for you and pray for you because of the suppressing grace of God upon you. Thanks be to God for his inexpressible gift. I don't know if you guys caught all that. We don't really have the time to really break it down too much. But kingdom growth happens when we are financially generous. When we give, we, uh, it says that God then gives us everything we give. When we give, God gives us everything. And then through that giving, he meets the needs of others through that generosity. And as a result, because we're seeing how God works in our life and, and other people are seeing how God works in their lives through all this generosity, everybody's faith grows. And when that happens, when we give, it also says that joy and thanksgiving grows. And when we give, the amount of people giving God glory grows. And when we give, love grows. God and one another. When we are generous with our finances, we both grow and prove that we love God. And so, how can we start being generous? Well, look at what Paul says here. Paul says in, in chapter 8, 2 Corinthians 8, 5, he says, but they gave themselves first to the Lord and then by the will of God to us. How do we know, if we want to be generous, how do we know what we should give? Well, the first thing that we need to do is you need to go to the Lord and ask God, how generous do you want me to be? How generous do you want me to be? And then, whatever you hear, give that amount. Because that's what it means when it says, it says at the end of that verse, by the will of God. Is they, they went to God, they gave themselves first to the Lord, they were generous that way, and then God told them what to give, and then they did it by the will of God. This year, I want to challenge us to be prepared to grow by being financially generous. And you know what? The amount, the amount doesn't matter. The amount doesn't matter. What matters is obeying God by faith. And so if God tells you to give $5, then you give $5. If God tells you to give $5,000, then you give $5,000. It's about obedience in, by faith. But know this, growing in Christ, if, we're, if that's what we're going to do, involves being generous financially. Now, the second thing that we need to do, we need to be generous with our giftings. We need to be generous with our giftings. Part of our foundation passage for this year of, of growing in Christ is this. First Peter 2 says, you yourselves, like living stones, are being built up or you're growing as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Then it goes on to say in verse 9, that you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood. If you are a Christian, you are part of that royal priesthood. What that means is that in God's kingdom, you have a job. God has a plan for your life. God has a purpose for your life. And through the natural gifts that he's created you with and through the power of the Holy Spirit who has imparted spiritual gifts to you, God is going to use your life. Therefore, be a royal priest. Or as the New England Patriots say, do your job. Do your job. <laughs> Stop it. You know that was hard for me to say. But this is the point. Generously use your giftings, whether it's time, whether it's resources, or spiritual gifts. Now, some of you might be saying, I don't even know what my spiritual gifts are, and, or I don't even know how to use them. That's okay. If that's where you're at right now, that is okay because that is what this year is all about. Our vision involves growing 
our gifts as we grow in Christ. And so we're going to help you do that throughout the year. But before we grow in our gifts, I think that we have to first be willing to use our gifts. And so let me give you a couple reasons why we should be willing to be generous with our giftings. The first thing I'm going to share with you is that if you haven't figured that out, this out by now, this, as far as the River Church, this is not the George Show. Despite what you may think, think, it is not the pastor's job, it is not the leadership's job to do all the work of the ministry. I know we live in a culture, and we really, really, really kind of live in a town that pretty much embraces the mentality that, why should I do the work? I got money. I give you money so that you could do the work. And if that's what you're thinking, that's, that's not really how the church works. And even myself as the pastor, my role as the pastor is not to do all the work. My role is to equip you. Ephesians 4 says this, and he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, and the teachers to equip the saints for the work of the ministry, for the building up the body, for, for building up the body of Christ. God has given the church leadership to help everybody use their giftings. Now, the second thing that I want to mention about this is that God designed it this way because it works best when we're all using our gifts together. See that last phrase, how it says, building up the body of Christ? The church is kind of like a human body. We're all connected, we're all working, and we're all useful. And if we are a body, meaning that I have a purpose and meaning that you have a purpose, it's important that all of us use those giftings, all of us use that purpose to work together. Because when that is not happening, things don't work right. Now, I probably shared this story before, but a couple months ago when I was marathon training, I, I injured my Achilles. And so the str strange thing, I, that's actually on this side. Um, but the strange thing is, is that I learned that my injury wasn't necessarily because I somehow, like, did something to this part of my leg. My injury was likely due, down here in my Achilles, was likely due to an overstrain in my calf, which could follow itself up the chain to a strain in my hip, which is connected to my core. And when I thought about it this way, I was like, oh, that makes sense, because some of you guys know that I hate core workouts. I neglect my core. I never focus on it. But core workouts are super important. But in my simple brain, I'm like, ooh, running, use legs. My leg's strong. Me good. You know, that, that's how I think. But running is really a whole body workout. And if your legs are the only things that are getting strengthened, things start to go wrong. And they did. I got injured. And the same thing is true about the church. If there's only a few of us who are serving, no matter how strong we are, it's not going to work right. God designed the church to be, the, the entire body of Christ to serve and grow together. And let me add this. Not only do things start to go wrong, but things start to get weird when one part grows and the other doesn't. Who here has heard this phrase, friends don't let friends skip leg day? <laughs> okay. No matter how buff your shoulders and chest and arms are, no matter how big they grow, it's, it just looks weird when the rest of your body isn't growing with them. Now, there are actual pictures that I could have shared, in, in real gym pictures, but I just didn't think that was appropriate. But you guys can imagine. You, maybe you've been to the gym and seen those dudes that are, like, super on, on top and then got, like, toothpicks on the bottom. That looks weird. That's because the body is not designed to grow that way. It's designed to grow together proportionally. And so my point is this, God designed all of us, the church, to grow and use our gifts together. And so let's be generous with our gifts. Romans 12 says this, for as we are one body, we have many members, and the members do not have all the same function. So we, though many, are one body and individually members one of another. Having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, let us use them if prophecy in proportion to our faith, if service in our serving, the one who teaches in his teaching, the one who exhorts in his exhortation, the one who contributes in generosity, the one who leads with zeal, and the one who does acts of mercy with 
Cheerfulness. What Paul is telling the Romans there in chapter 12 is that we are to be generously using our gifts. If you got them, use them. God designed the church to, to, to grow together this way. And so we can almost say that friends don't let friends serve at church alone. And so if you are not serving yet, come talk to me after service. Let's get you plugged in and using your gifts, or at least at a place where you begin to discover what your gifts are. Because when we serve together, we get this what I call Holy Spirit growth. You know, the other week we did, Janelle and I, we did this free, uh, free trial on Amazon Prime for the HBO channel. You guys ever notice that on Amazon Prime you can, like, select certain channels and they, like, they'll give you a couple days free? Now, the reason why we, we did it free is because Noel had never seen Land Before Time. You guys know Land Before Time? You don't know Land Before Time? Okay. Most of you do and you should know. Come on. But he had never seen that, and so I looked it up on Amazon Prime, and it says, oh, you can see this movie for free if you do the HBO channel free trial. And so we're like, okay, we did the five-day tr free trial. And so I'm, I'm mentioning this not because I'm a fan of HBO content, but while we had it, I, I watched a miniseries on there on Chernobyl. And it was super interesting. If you guys don't know, Chernobyl was that Russian city that had that nuclear meltdown in the 80s. And in that show, they're talking about, they're like reenacting everything that happened. And in that show, there's this scene where the investigator is explaining what happened. And so, as you can assume, creating nuclear power is a complex process. And I'll phrase it this way. A lot of things need to happen for things not to go wrong. Everything needs to be working properly or it's going to end up bad. And in the meltdown... It wasn't like somebody threw a grenade into the reactor. No, it, it was a series of really small errors that compiled and compounded upon each other and led to the disaster. But when things were working all together, they had nuclear power. They had, they had more than enough power than they needed. And here's where I'm going with this. When we all, as the church, when we're all using our gifts together, I believe we got to get a nuclear power. And that's when we see, when we have that type of power, that's when we see powerful growth happen in our lives and in our church and in our community. And so let me challenge you this way for this point. Don't skip leg day, okay? Instead, get that spirit, nuclear power. So this year, be ready to be generous with your giftings as you grow in Christ. Now, the third thing I want to say is that we need to be generous with ourselves. We need to be generous with ourselves. And so whether it is financially or whether it's with our giftings, living generously requires this crucial step. We need to be generous with ourselves. And let me explain what I mean by that. We are all born sinners. What that means is that we have a natural desire from birth to rebel against God. It is not natural for us to do things God's way. And that applies to generosity. It's easy, I don't know, let me, let me hear it if, if you guys can relate to this. It's easy to be greedy and selfish. Yeah? All right. It is unnatural to be generous. And if you don't believe me, you can walk out of this room right now and go to the left and go to the River Littles room. Okay? Even at three, they know how to keep all of the good toys for themselves. They have to be taught to share or to give. It's natural for them to be like, no, mine. And, I, and then if somebody else has something good, they don't want what they have. They want what you have. That's easy. And I mention this because it's not going to be easy for us to grow in generosity. We need to intentionally challenge ourselves, sometimes by faith, to be generous. Now, to help you with this, let me share a verse that's guided me in this area. It's one of my favorite verses. Galatians 2.20 says this. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I love this verse because it teaches me that Jesus generously gave himself for me. 
But it also teaches me that in return, in response, I need to begin generously giving myself to him. And I know that's easier said than done. Actually, I know it's this. I know that that's hard. That is hard for us to do. You want to know how I know that is a hard task, that is a hard mentality to live by? I know that it's hard because it was hard for Jesus to do that. Before Jesus went to the cross, he was praying in the Garden of Gethsemane. And during that prayer, Jesus discussed with his father what was about to happen. He was about to sacrifice or he was about to give his perfect life to pay for the sins of the world. And when asked to generously give himself in that way, it says that Jesus responded this way in prayer. He said, my father, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. Let me ask you a question because we just had this holiday pass. If a little kid, if you were, let's say you're at Walgreens, if a little kid was standing in front of you and he was trying to buy his mom a little Valentine's gift in front of you, but he was a dollar short, what would you do? You give him the dollar, right? You'd step in and be like, here, buddy, I got you. You give him the dollar, you pay for it. You step in and pay the debt. Let me just tell you, that is not what Jesus did on the cross. Jesus didn't pay a little small debt. Jesus paid an impossible debt. He paid a debt that no man could ever pay. Not even mankind collectively, if we gathered all of ourselves and tried to pay it, we could never pay it. It was an immeasurable debt. Additionally, not only did he have to pay for the sins of the world, but that payment also included absorbing the wrath of God against those sins. So when Jesus said, Father, is there any other way for this to happen? It wasn't because he was wimping out. He rightfully wanted that moment to pass from him because he knew what it would cost. To generously give himself was hard, but then he did it anyways. And that's the type of person that God is growing us into in 2020. He is making us like Jesus. And so growth, know this, growth will cost us as it costs Christ. Generosity requires sacrifice. It involves embracing a life that says, I have been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Jesus who lives in me. And the life that I now live right here on earth, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. It involves understanding what John the Baptist knew when he, and when John the Baptist said, he, that is Jesus, must increase and I must decrease. And it involves obeying what Jesus taught when he says, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. As we grow, it is going to cost us. It will require learning to sacrifice by denying ourselves, denying ourselves the things that we want to do in order for us to be able to do that God wants us to do. And so this year, be prepared to generously Give yourself the same way that Jesus gave himself. Expect it and then press into it even when it's hard. And watch how Jesus transforms your life when you're willing to do that by faith. And I guarantee at the end, you will say it was worth it. And so as we close, I want... I just want to say I want our church to have a culture of generosity. Actually, if you look at the back of your bulletin where we have our mission and vision and and core values, you will see that generosity is one of our core values. It's how we do things here at the River Church. And the reason why we have that is because we want to be like Jesus because Jesus is generous. But to build that type of culture, it requires us to know that there is a cost associated with it. It'll require us to be generously fin- or generous financially. It will require us to be generous with our giftings, our time, our talent, our resources. And it will, be, it will cost us as far as being generous with ourselves, being like, Lord, I am yours. Whatever you want from me, I'm going to do it. And so let us grow into a generous people because we serve a generous God. And As we finish this Vision 2020 series, I hope that there is at least a little part of you that is excited about what God's going to do this year. I hope there's a little bit of of you that is prepared and, and looking forward to what God has in store for you. 
I hope that you're ready to leave the old things behind and embrace the new things that God has for us. And I hope that you're motivated to grow and, again, ready to do whatever it takes because Jesus is worth it. And so I'm going to call the worship team up. And and just right now and even in this last song, I want us to take a moment to give an uh, to, to. I want to take a moment to give an opportunity for all of us to respond to Jesus. And so maybe you are here and you know God is calling you to a certain level of generosity, but it scares you, scares you to be generous. And if that's you, that's okay. But let me say, don't let that fear stop you. Instead, take that fear and transform it into faith in God and give God whatever he's asking you to do. And in that, you will grow. Or maybe you're sitting here or listening online, and what really caught your attention is is the fact that, that we talked about how Jesus loves you and that he generously gave himself for you. Maybe you've heard that before, or maybe it just has never resonated with you that way. That he had died for your sins. He's given you the greatest gift ever. And something inside of you is like, hey, you got to respond to that. you got to respond to that. And so whatever it is that you're going through, whether it's through generosity, whether it's through serving, or whether it's coming to Jesus for the first time, let me encourage you, respond to Jesus as Lord. Tell him that you are ready to do whatever he asks because you know that he's worth it. Put your faith, put your trust in him and grow into the person that he's created you to be. And if you're here this morning and if you need prayer, you would like to talk to somebody about some of the things that we talked about today or about what God is doing in your life, come see me at the back or really anybody who has a green lanyard on. And if you're online, we would love if you would just send us a message or an email. We'd love to hear from you. We'd love to pray with you. But whatever it is, get yourself plugged in and growing in Christ. And so next week, let me close by, finally close by this. Make sure to join us next week because we're going to finally start. We're going to move out of the vision, and we're going to finally start with our Lego series. And so we're going to start off with the first section. It's going to be called a Duplo series. And so it's like the beginning blocks of Legos. And so come next week and see what that means, because that may make no sense to you. So you got to come next week to find out. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for all that you're doing, God. And we thank you for Jesus, the generous gift that you gave us. Lord, and we pray that as Galatians 2.20 said, Lord, we pray that, that we would consider our lives not our own anymore. But the life that we now live, that we would live God, the one who gave himself for us, the one who loved us, Lord. And so whatever needs to happen, whether it's in, uh, in finances, whether that's in time, whether that's in resources, uh, whether it's in denying ourselves, God, move in our hearts by your Holy Spirit and begin to to move us to action, whether through repentance or whether that's taking a step in faith. God, move us to do uh, whatever it is you would have us do so that we can become the people that you've called us to be. 